The modern world is getting a lesson in the scope of pandemics. From high death rates and outbreak hotspots to economic decline due to lockdown measures, 2020 will be a year earmarked in history. This piece is not intended to paint a gloomy or a rosy picture of the COVID-19 pandemic or critique one nation's approach versus another. It is simply designed to convey information in a visually compelling way. This chart visualizes the general strategy that most countries are using to cope with the pandemic, where flattening the curve reduces overstressing of healthcare systems and buys time for scientists to understand the disease. COVID-19 has had a drastic impact since its January 2020 outbreak in China. The reproduction number of COVID-19 has been estimated near two. This means it spreads easily. For instance, at an estimated R value of two, each person infects an average of two people, as visualized here. With no artificial or natural immunity, this graphic shows the spread of the virus after several rounds of infection. Regardless of cause, data is showing that overall death tolls are noticeably higher this year. In Northern Italy's Bergamo province, even with lockdown measures in place, figures show the early week's fatalities of the COVID-19 outbreak compared with previous year's baseline fatalities are significant. Deaths in England and Wales paint a similar picture, where a baseline five-year average of overall fatalities show that 2020 is unique. One thing that is challenging in the daily news cycle is putting fatalities in perspective. Is 300 deaths in a week a lot? How many people die in my region on a normal day in other years? These figures compare a baseline average of deaths from other major conditions in the past five years. While things like heart disease and cancer kill year in and year out, and viruses are preventable in the long run, the current impact of COVID-19 is significant. Statistics for fatalities in hard-hit New York State also show the regional stress. While Louisiana and California statistics show that pandemics hit different places in different ways. Nursing homes with high-risk individuals living in close quarters account for a striking percentage of initial COVID-19 deaths in the United States. But heavy social distancing is a blunt tool. It has enormous costs. Stay-at-home orders with business and school closures ravage economies. In the U.S. alone, unemployment claims since the pandemic hit in early March are staggering. The global travel industry, valued at 5.29 trillion, has also been crushed. These TSA airport screening quantities comparing an April Sunday in 2019 versus one in 2020 show a 95% drop in air travel. But did 30% unemployment have to be the reality? How did some countries protect their people without a complete lockdown? The goal with controlling disease spread early in pandemics is to lower the R value. A hypothetical R value of 0.75 can help illustrate disease control. At a value below one, reduction of spread is achieved where each carrier infects less than one person before clearing the disease. The viral presence eventually folds upon itself as it is not able to infect enough new hosts to spread. This can be done by intervention through testing, quarantine, mask use, and hygiene. South Korea, a country that has already experienced in fighting another coronavirus via the MERS outbreak in 2015, instituted collective pandemic culture to help fight COVID-19. Enforcement is real. $2,500 fines are levied if someone is without a mask in public. Temperature testing at restaurants is used. Extensive contact tracing and testing is done, where positive patients' previous interactions are tracked backwards to squash outbreaks. The better the contact tracing, the more surgical we can be in cutting hotspots out of society, allowing normal activities to endure. How a high-risk contact is treated is also relevant to reducing community spread, but the methods employed may raise other questions.
In China, the popular payment app Alipay has been outfitted to double as a COVID control tool. Before accessing crowded places like subways or malls, people are required to download the latest health code app, which includes an onboarding process with questions about the user's symptoms. A color coding system on screen is then assigned to each user. Green means free movement is allowed. Someone with a yellow screen may be required to stay at home for seven days. And a red screen means a mandatory two-week quarantine. This video, shot by New York Times reporter Paul Mosier, the subway guard in Hangzhou, shows commuters being checked for the color coding. Official Q&A info for the service says a yellow or red code may be given to someone who has had contact with an infected person, visited a virus hot zone, or reported having symptoms in the sign-up form. This suggests that the app interfaces with train and bus bookings and government-held databases. This system is bolstered by manpower, where citizens are also flagged at manned checkpoints. No one knows how to make their code green, and some examples of this are extreme. As reported by the New York Times on March 1st, Vanessa Wong, age 25, has been stuck in her hometown in Hubei province, the original global epicenter of the coronavirus, for weeks. But her employer and her housing complex in Hangzhou require a green code in the app to return. She's been symptom-free for weeks, and with no response for authorities, speculate she is code red only because she is physically in Hubei. This implicit digital quarantine is a daunting concept for those in the Western world to wrap their heads around, and digital privacy concerns should carry a heavy weight. You might ask, aren't we creating antibodies? Won't everyone be immune soon? Past infection can offer a major reprieve from some viruses, but only if that disease's antibodies confer immunity. COVID-19 specifically attacks cells by bonding with its ACE2 receptor. The virus is then engulfed by the cell where it hijacks the cell's machinery and replicates itself millions of times. The cell eventually bursts, releasing new viruses systemically. When our immune system responds, antibodies are created by white blood cells to fight viruses. They have an antigen binding site with a shape that must fit perfectly in order to bond to a virus. The wide variety of binding sites shows the versatility of antibodies to recognize and protect against many types of viruses, as well as restricting the antigens from damaging other benign bystanders in the blood. Once antibodies take hold of the virus spikes, they neutralize the virus from attacking normal human cells. Once the infection is squashed, Antibodies remain anywhere from days to years, depending on the disease, to fight off the virus or other antigen again. This is considered immunity and operates to varying degrees. For instance, the mere quantity of antibodies does not tell the whole picture. With the virus that causes chickenpox, infection bestows near universal long-lasting resistance. The bacterium that causes tetanus, on the other hand, offers no protection when contracted naturally while HIV-positive patients often have large quantities of antibodies, but they do nothing to prevent the disease. At the time of publishing this piece, the natural immunity conferred by COVID-19 is still unknown. Regardless of immunity, antibody testing is important to know who has had the disease at any point in time and to do some more accurate mortality rate. However, COVID-19 is presenting a challenge in relation to false positives. What are false positives? They are a test result implying antibody presence for a disease, when in fact someone had a similar but different disease. COVID-19's coronavirus antigen binding site is very similar to other coronaviruses, like the common cold. There is a lot to be hopeful for in the coming months. A treatment may offer a major reprieve. By looking at how the virus mechanics work, we can better understand antiviral drug development after this coronavirus has penetrated a human cell, RNA polymerases specific to the virus identify strands of human DNA to transcribe into messenger RNA. This RNA polymerase seeks code sequences in our normal cell DNA to cue proteins needed to build new COVID-19 viral units.
antiviral drugs such as remdesivir intend to target the RNA polymerase mechanism, shutting down this replication. For vaccines, the long lead times is due to the large trial sizes and thorough observations required to ensure the vaccine won't do more harm than the disease itself. For example, figures from trials for Roterix, a 2008 gastrointestinal vaccine, shows how large some of these vaccine efficacy tests can be. Experts who worked on SARS-1 vaccines in the last decade believe that cross-protection to COVID-19 is likely if their work had continued, as these two viruses share an immense amount of genetic similarity. Researchers in Texas were ready to begin human trials on a SARS-1 vaccine in 2016. But at this point, SARS-1 seemed to be old news, and investment or grants were never secured. Without reform, the market-driven nature of vaccine development is not likely to change, where reactionary research is common after the situation is already unfolding. This has been a production of Stanchion, a USA-based studio. We ourselves are not doctors, epidemiologists, or scientists. We are artists, attempting to visualize information and theories developed by people much smarter than ourselves. With a novel virus, there is no perfect answer. We all learn together. Please approach all things you see on the internet with cautious suspicion. A thorough list of references to information in this video is available in the description below. Special thanks to Chicago medical professionals, Greg Minista and April John for contributing to this piece. John Dickey, stationed in Seoul, South Korea, for contributing footage to this project. And thanks to associate producers, Kayla Weigel and Graham Kimmel. Motion graphics consulting provided by Zach Citro and Shui Bauman.